small business owners know cutting costs without cutting quality is tough. How do you trim expenses without hurting your business? Easy. Get Spectrum Business. Call 888-489-2212. Switch to Spectrum Business and you can get the best internet and phone services for half of what you're paying today. Cutting costs can be easy when you get Spectrum Business. Just call 888-489-2212. Restrictions apply. Call for details. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. This is down to the wire. One shot to take you to the top. One win. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. This is Gresham Keith. Nick Ritchie, he stinks. Like useless. Like no offensive ability. Krejci on the right to Ritchie. Scores! I think he stinks. <laughs> ha! Got him! Two goal comeback in the third period. And the Bruins win in a shootout. Andy Gresh. Bigger decision is Eduardo. The team's not going to win a lot of games, and he's going to miss a lot of starts. You stole my yes, line. Sorry, damn it. He's running out of time to be with us early. We have to be careful with him. Rich Keith. Bill Belichick gave the San Francisco 49ers a gift. How about returning the favor? Not only do you give Jimmy G back, what you give them, Cam Newton? Oh, boy. Gresh and Keith starts right now. Noticeably shorter members. It shrinks? I'm not I mean, going to look up the video. I'm not going to do that. On WEEI. Every time I hear that Stephen A thing, I want to go off, but we're not doing that until tomorrow. Red Sox home opener is tomorrow right here on WEEI, WEEI Sports Radio Network. And... Uh, I know that there are a lot of people who are very sensitive to talking about the actual game of baseball. And I'm not talking about Red Sox pitching staff or Darwin's and Hernandez or, you know, uh, anybody in the Red Sox lineup, Kike Hernandez. No, 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 no. We're talking about the actual game of baseball. The sweet science. In a lot of ways, the grand old game is under siege because it has become more analytically driven. A bit. There are a lot of people who think that you don't even need a manager now. Somebody just punches into a computer and tells you what to do, and some robot can walk out there <laughs> Pretty much. and make all these moves. And yeah. and off of well, your reaction, because this is the first time I've ever said that around yeah, yeah, here, right. but by judging your reaction, whether that is the reality, that is the perception of the game of baseball yeah, right now. Yeah, and I think it is the reality also. And I think, you know, Billy Bean, for example, got a lot of credit for his Moneyball deal out in Oakland, right, when he started to do that. But again, we talked about it earlier. Smaller markets had to think differently. But now the big markets are thinking like the small markets are. And there are way too many players in today's game that are the three outcome players. Like Adam Dunn for a while was one of... However oh. many guys in the league, home run, walk, strike out. He'd go up there, smack a tater. He'd hit 40 dingers a year. He'd hit 220. He'd strike out 150 times, and he'd walk a bunch. <laughs> it was three things. Take and so, 150. And, and with baseball, again, out of the four major sports, baseball is always going to have the least amount of action. But when you're also taking guys up there that are either swinging for the fences, and, yeah, they hit the home run. We all love the home run. Mm-hmm. Or they're striking out, or they're just taking their base. There's not enough, you know, just base hits anymore or guys that are going from first to third or guys that steal a lot of bases like some of the like other fun aspects that are outside of the home run in baseball there's less and less of it and guys don't care about striking out like that used to be a point of pride for a lot of players is you go up like Tony Gwynn would like never strike out in a whole season it was almost like offensive to him if you were like oh my god you struck out and now somebody could go I mean how many times do you see it they might go uh, one for five with four strikeouts, but they hit a dong. So, all right, all good. You had a great game, and they, they they don't care. Like that's just that's just what it is. And then it just it leads to less action. Like how many innings will go by, and the pitcher strikes out the side, and you know he also walked a guy or two, but the outfielders never even move. You know the shortstop's not making a diving play in the hole, and then you know t- tossing somebody out. I know people have also got upset about the shifts too, and again that's sort of analytics where 
all right, we know the guy always hits it here, so go stand over there. So David Ortiz could rip one in the hole, but you have your second baseman playing short right like he's in softball, and he's like, just snares it. Keith, how come Big Poppy can't lay down a bun? I'm going to hang up right? and listen. Great call, sir. I, I agree with you. You should probably <laughs> slap it the other way. But that's just that's sort of what it's become. So how do you do it? Like How, how do you change that part of it? And I don't know. <sighs> I like, don't know and the, either. And the sign-stealing thing, and that's why it, it, the Alex Cora – and, and if you want to say it was just Houston or also here in Boston, doesn't matter. That part has also slowed the game down to a halt because pitchers are terrified that these guys are stealing signs, whether they're doing it fairly or unfairly or they're getting spied on in center field or whatever. And that's why you'll have nobody on base. Starting pitcher looking at the catcher, shaking off, shaking off, looking at the indicator. What's the sign? Come back out here. Hey, I don't know. We got to go over there. <laughs> like, wait a minute. Remember, it used to just be you would only do uh, the indicator if there was a guy on second base. Because obviously the guy on second base can look in and see. Yep. But any other time you didn't need it. But now they're so scared of it, and it just slows it down. And the and the players are so afraid to give in to the pitch clock or any kind of idea of speeding the game up. And that's a problem. When the games are well over three hours and there's not a whole lot of action in said three hours, it's a t- it, It's becoming a tough sport to defend. It is. And there are guys like Theo Epstein, who, of course, we know, former Red Sox GM and VP here and went and won a World Series with the Cubs. And, you know, his hand is stamped and will eventually make the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. But it's interesting. Theo has now become like an advisor for Major League Baseball But he's also working with some of these VC groups who are looking at baseball as possible opportunities for their own expansion, as, of course, has been discussed here in Boston, that, you know, when when you start owning billion dollar sports entities, it was only a matter of time before those kinds of folks and the venture capitalists and people like that, A, would look to get in and B, It's really rich owners already who are looking for people with more money than them to be able to kind of attach themselves to. So I think Theo is in a real interesting spot. Now, in this conversation that The Athletic has sort of printed up kind of the highlights, it was with Jason Stark on the Starkville podcast, and apparently Theo used the word love 23 times in one conversation with him and Doug Glanville, but some of it was also Pearl Jam and Deep Dish Pizza and stuff. (laughs) But he loves the game of baseball, right? Yes, he does, yes. Theo was quoted as saying, among other things, I think everyone in the game can look at the product on the field right now and say, while we love it and baseball is as important to us and as special to us as ever, it's probably not the very best version of the game that's possible in the universe. Uh, And he went on to say, what is the very best version of baseball? What's the most enjoyable version of baseball? The most entertaining version of baseball? The version that brings you the most joy and that will bring other people the most joy? And what does it look like? That should be what we're shooting for. We should be shooting for the absolute very best version of the game. But isn't that the crux of the issue? Yeah, how do you get there? But what was the best version of the game? Like, look, I spent the first 15 years of my life in western Pennsylvania. So there was no DH. You Pitching staff was handled differently. You know, and for me, I could, like, the lineup around the diamond because I had the memory burn of guys like Chico Lean, right? Like, Chico Lean at second base would hit, like, 230. Right. But because he could pick it, and back then, yep, if right. you had a middle in, if your middle infielder hit, like, two fifths, like catcher now, right? Mm-hmm. If your catcher now hits 250, it's great. It used to be, like, if your shortstop or second baseman can hit 250 or 275, it feels like the numbers, while they were completely exploded during the steroid era, I don't think we now have any conception of the numbers that really matter because of that and all the analytics that are in the game now because GMs aren't reacting to yeah. the numbers that we used to as fans. It's, it's also part of the uh, put the toothpaste back in the tube type of thing because for me, if you're talking about, hey, when was baseball at its best? Again, it also might have to factor in what my age was, but – the Maguire Sosa home run battle mm-hmm. because 94 was just so deflating for young fans or all fans, but for young fans where 94 pff, gone, you just, you know, you don't have a world series in 94. So a few years later, how do you build that back up? And so you had the home run chase because in baseball, baseball might've been the only sport where the numbers actually mattered, but here's the thing. Once you pass those numbers, they don't matter as much. And once you admit that, all right, guys were all gassed up, 
they don't really matter as much. So is, is Barry Bonds the home run champ to you, or is it somebody else or somebody else? Right, like to me, it's so like, Barry Bonds. <laughs> yes, right. And, and, and so, but Roger Maris's number stood. So you have the individual season that stood for such a long time, and right. then you have the all time one that stood mm-hmm. for so long. They both get broken. All right, now what? And also locally. Red Sox Yankees could not have possibly been better from 03 and 04. As bad, but also as interested as we were in 03, and then as good as it was in 04, it'll just literally never get back to being that good again. The whole curse, people crying when they won. Why would you cry now? They've won several times. No. So it's like, I think, combination of the home run and the steroid thing, you can't really go back to that. That's not going to happen. That perfect storm of Sosa versus McGuire. That was, we talk about now how football rules the day all the time. It's always football. Very, Very much the, the so. lead story. Is, I mean, the lead story yesterday is pro days at Alabama. Mm-hmm. But do you remember McGuire Sosa? I Every would get day. home from yep. school. Who Did somebody hit a, like, Sosa played a lot of day games. So you'd get home from school. You're like, did Sosa go yard today? You'd watch baseball tonight to see the going, going, gone. I was obsessed with it. I loved it. But how do you duplicate that again? Like, I don't, that might not even be baseball's fault anymore because, they needed those guys then to get people back in the door. Then Barry Bonds makes those guys look kind of like a joke. He's like, hey, here's what it would look like if a good player right. took the sauce. And the walks now, that year is the number that well, stands yeah. out where you're like, oh, my right. God. But that also is at a time where, yes, you had Greg Vaughn hit a million taters and Vinny Castilla. And like there were some random guys I know. Luis Gonzalez that went 37, yeah. hit like 50 <laughs> bombs, <laughs> like, and Schilling defended him. Like, I didn't do anything. So Wait, you, ha- what? you had those guys, but I don't know. I feel like you also had a mix of, like, you you know, the Robbie Alomars and some of these other guys that hitting 330 mattered and stealing some bases. Matt, you had the tail end of Ricky Henderson. I think maybe I'm glorifying it because I was younger then, but I don't know how you change that and, and make it now. Like, so even if Theo Epstein in this case was, all right, describe in today's world how you make the most interesting version of baseball. I think it's tough because the numbers and then the rivalry of Red Sox-Yankees was what really pushed it over the top. And I don't know how you duplicate either one of those things. Yeah, ESPN is still shoving it down our throats. It's like mm-hmm. Kramer with his uh, friend, the optometrist, shoving cantaloupe <laughs> down your throat. Yeah, right. hopped up on cinnamon swirls. Mm-hmm. You know, now ESPN, it's still shoving it down our throat. I think that might shift a little bit to maybe Padres Dodgers. We may end up getting some of those yeah. because the Padres are So you are, might hit on it. A guy like Fernando Tatis Jr. might be the last hope. They need a breakout star. Yeah. And unfortunately for Major League Baseball... We all know that Mike Trout's a great player, but people on the East Coast are not staying up till twelve thirty yeah. in the morning to see him with a big at bat in the you know eighth right. inning in and a game that matters. I think he's played in the playoffs once. Yeah, three time MVP. Right, played right. in the playoffs Been once. Second might, bunch. No joke. Might be once. the greatest baseball player of all time. He may end not up, even yeah. being silly. He's the modern day Mickey Mantle. Yeah, and. He's played in the playoffs once. His team always stinks, and on the East Coast, we barely see him play. Uh, it's interesting because you said in that that you would come home from school on the whole McGuire Sosa home run chase, yeah. and that was like my first full year in sports talk radio. So oh, I remember talking story. about yeah. that. Well, I remember like there was that point in August where I think the Cardinals went to Florida. And McGuire hit like five home runs in like a three game series mm-hmm. or something like that, and that's when the that's when the train really started rolling. It's interesting from Theo Epstein here, though, Keith, and and I think he hits on something that might be the one thing to try to clean up right away. One fifteen, Gresh and Keith on WEI WEI Sports Radio Network at Gresh Keith on Twitter at Keith twenty one at the Real Gresh G R E S H. That's where you can get us on Twitter. Here's among the things that Theo touched on with Jason Stark. And he was asked, the biggest difference in baseball since he first became a fan. In He said, quote, in 1990, the strikeout rate was under 15%. There you go. Now it's almost 25%. So that's a huge difference. If I, and he said, if we could change one thing, get one thing under control for me, it would be the strikeout rate. Are you buying that? I agree with it. I don't know how you do it. Like, I don't know what you say because these guys now just would rather go up and hit a dinger. That, like, that's kind of what it is. Or just get on base, but, but you know, take a walk and all that other stuff. So how do you get guys to care about striking out? There's no shame in striking out anymore. At all. No, you're right. I was striking five times in a game. Because before it would be guys like like (laughs) William Mopania and a few others. I was like Rob Deere, if you want to go back there. Jack Clark. There were guys that struck out a lot, but there was a few of them. Now it's like every team has those guys, and it's eh, no big deal. Yeah, get them next time. Nobody even looks twice at it. 
I remember even playing as like a, a I played baseball my entire life and there was you struck out you felt awful right you're like oh my god I can't believe I struck you're out. almost shamed can't it's believe like, I struck oh you got to put the bat on the ball kid yeah do something yeah, yeah. make make a play right. you're like I just I can't believe it now it's like eh, as long as you hit a home run you know uh, once during a weekend series or something you're going to be all right so I do agree with Theo because let's get some more action again there's already just the nature of the sport not going to be a tremendous amount of action but if you know you're getting nine strikeouts in a game like every inning one of the outs is just a swing and a miss or, or taking a pitch rather than smoking a line drive and having the center fielder make a highlight catch or a shortstop throw throw a ball in the hole or something like that then yeah it's going to be it's going to be i mean the the, the b word with baseball is boring right and and that if you have all these strikeouts that's what it is and it's also watered down the numbers for pitchers that we used to get excited about whenever pedro would have a big performance and he would get 12, 13, 15 strikeouts. Right, that was it'd be awesome. like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Pedro was on, right? Because right. you thought of the game differently. Now, yeah, anybody's getting somebody seven, get eight 12 strikeouts. strikeouts you know. It's like, what a yeah, yeah. It's, it's not that big a deal. Theo also said he is a fan of pitch clocks. Quote, I was fearful that the pitch timer would just be too disruptive to the natural flow of the game. And then I went to some minor league games. And what you find is that after the first month, it seemed like it had been there forever. It was totally natural. I know I'm not like the whole how it would work, you know, like do do you stand out of the box for 10, you know, 10 seconds and then do you get in and when does it start and does the yeah. batter have the ability to control that and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't hate it. I think it's a part of the natural evolution of the game. But I don't think that's a like I think that's a fix that fans aren't going to care about in two weeks. Well, maybe, but the players also keep saying no to it, and the players have so much power. I mean, you talk about the opposite of football, where the players they have their guaranteed contracts, mm-hmm. they get everything that they want, and so it seems like they keep saying no. Although the fact that it's been in the minor leagues is good. So now, pretty soon, you're going to have a generation of guys that Bingo. are used to it. Yeah, and think about this too: when you, when you look at some of the pitchers, one of the reasons why Greg Maddox and Mark Burley. And even let's face it, Chris Sale are more fun to watch as they get the ball and go. They're not doing the David Price walk around the mound, wipe a sweat, Make put the, the ball hat. out, let me mm. step off, let me step off. Like no more at the plate, everybody's Clay Buckholz. Yeah, they're like, oh my god, with Clay Buckholz, like what are we doing here? That guy. Some guys get it and go. Now I'm not expecting every single guy to have the Maddox or Burley pace, right? But just in the back of your mind, if it's let's go, let's just let's go, I think that's so much better for the game. I would agree, but. Uh, Theo mentioned something else here. This is interesting. He would consider moving the mound back. I think it's impossible to talk about how to restore the right balance between modern pitchers and modern hitters without giving consideration to the dimensions. I don't even think you need to move it back two feet to learn about potential solutions. I think if you even did half that amount, if you move the mound back a foot, you would give hitters an extra hundredth of a second to be able to react, and he talked about how that would be a worthwhile experiment. So I actually don't hate this, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna change baseball, it can't just be minor tweaking, right? Mm-hmm. Like it needs sort of a little bit of a shake. And I know some might say, "Well, this sounds like a minor tweaking," but it's not. These guys are so much bigger and stronger now than they were before. That if, if it was always 60 feet, 6 inches back in the day, where these guys that have full-time jobs, they, they show up, they're drinking beers, and they're throwing... Like, it's a little bit different <laughs> they than... Use, they use camp to get yeah. ready, not show up ready to camp. Well, how many guys in the league 50 years ago threw 95 miles an hour, and how many guys on a team now throw 95 miles an hour? Yeah, there weren't a lot of Nolan Ryans out there no. throwing heat. So it's actually... It's a good point. I mean, but then you get into the, you know, are we changing how far away the bases are are we changing the stadium i guess we already have changed the stadiums but that part's not as bad i know pitchers are going to get upset because they have done in the past raise uh, raise the mound lower the mound all that that crap would be to, the to, real to, way to make a big change quickly they could do that but even moving it back a little bit just because again guys don't throw that like when the game started yep guys weren't throwing nearly as hard and so now these hitters who again they're the best at what they do and it's why it's the most difficult thing in sports but so many guys throw 95, 98, 99. Evaldi's throwing 100 now. And, yeah, you don't have – that's not a surprise why strikeouts are up. It's interesting, too, that I, I saw on Lou's Twitter about spin rate. He tweeted out a video on Trevor Bauer. 
which is worth eight minutes of your time. You're on the hopper. Go to at Lou Merloni on Twitter. Scroll down on the timeline. You'll see the video that he put on there because this whole discussion about having just an extra foot and you look at what could be happening with pitchers and what they're doing to get the spin rate up on the ball. Like Trevor Bauer has basically called other people. Garrett Cole, in fact, is the guy yeah. that in that video you'll see that he called out. And it was like, gee, I wonder what substance can end up giving me more spin rate. And then they put in the video about how everybody you mentioned with the pitchers, like they're farting around with their, oh, you know, they're God. wiping something off of their bill of their cap or whatever oh, yeah. it is. Yeah. But to that point... If you're doing something to doctor up the ball and you move back a foot, does it force you to do it even more? Does it all of a sudden become a mind screw for some of those guys that are doing something like that? But what would it do to the spin rate on the ball? How could it change? There could be a big trickle-down effect that I think they're looking at. And by the way, you mentioned the whole little things. Like He he touched on how there's an anti-shift rule being tried out in double A. Is that really the end of the world? I mean, do we really need would, – would ending the shift – I think people feel like there would be more be balls in play. I personally say line up wherever you want, and I guess that is kind of counter to my other take is like I, I want there to be more hits in baseball and allow that to happen. Uh, but I do think that there – Theo's not alone in thinking that. That Correct. if you just have them play where they're supposed to play, because how many times, and Ortiz is an example here, but there are guys around the league that shift. It used to just be for the the lefty that pulls. Now it's for both sides. And Ortiz would smoke a ball in the short right, and the second baseman was just standing there and snares it. And you're like, oh, all right. Otherwise, the inning would have kept going. There would have been a, there would have been a, you know some movement on the base paths and things like that. So I get it, but I also think, all right, you should be able to line up wherever you want. Uh, He also said that players need to be part of the solution. Quote, the players I've talked to, they're absolutely open to changes that would promote action and return the game in some ways to the way it's traditionally been played. I think that's an issue we absolutely should have common ground on just making the game as entertaining as possible. I would hope that players would not look at things like this and think that it's destroying the game or hurting their ability to make money. Because if you can impact a game in different ways, right now, if you're fast, it better translate into defense or your instincts of being a great base runner. Because on the whole, Rich, I don't know if speed really matters in the game as much as it used to, but that is also a way for a guy to justify why they should be paid. So if there are going to be changes made that can show off the athleticism of these guys, you would think that for some of them it would translate into dollars if they're good. Yeah, you would think so, but it's like some teams, only so many have that sort of team mentality of, hey, we want to run and then grab an extra base. Because now it used to be, hey, don't try to steal second if Manny Ramirez is up or somebody like that is up. But now down the lineup, it's even the seven hitter. You're like, well, he might be able to rip a 20, you know, 20 home run season. So don't run into an out. And it's all like, it's the numbers thing. It's like, well, what's the advantage of being on second, but we have the guy on like the risk reward. Ah, just don't run. And that's another thing that could add a little bit of excitement to the game. And, and you're taking the most part, out of the manager's hands too. the whole hit and run things of that oh, yeah. nature, you know, no, like, no, forget happens. about it. My yeah, God. Happens. How, how dare we do anything like that? All right, let's trend. Or crash and keep right now on WEEI. Appreciate everybody tuning in. We're sipping smoke. I'm your host, Cam Newton. It's a dope ass spot. In order for me to impact and empower my community, I need to be me. They can be able to relate to it and say, man, Cam came out of these streets. I can come out of these streets. I refuse to just be in a box. I'm not too ashamed to say thank you for inspiring me. Don't inhale. They tell me. No, sir. What are we toasting to? We're going to toast to prosperity. Yes, sir. Here's to everybody to get some. It keeps getting. I toast for that. I I shall, too. And one finger, one pinky, one thumb, one love. We are out of here. That was uh, Cam Newton on uh, Sip and Smoke when he talked to Wiggy. No, I'm kidding. It's just uh, Cam hanging out oh, with his you know boys Wiggy and whatnot. Get you on think, there. Oh are you a God. cigar guy? I am not, no. But I'm saying anything Cam Newton, Wiggy would be in favor of. Have you ever cigar or no. not your deal? No. Don't touch the stuff. <laughs> I enjoy them. I don't. Never uh, even had one.
No, I mean, no, I haven't either. And I've even wow. been to, uh, I had to go to a cigar bar once because it was like part part of my buddy's bachelor party. And it was like me and one other guy didn't smoke. Everybody Ugh. else was. Your clothes just reek. Yeah, for yeah. Like, mu- you had to burn them. You get rid Friend of, of the show, Steve Diossi. Big, uh, loved oh, them, God. Loves he smokes cigars so much on the show. And he does a selfie when it, before he ever came on the show, which is just him smoking a cigar in his car before the he old post game show with uh, Glenn and, and Fred and Steve, those guys would just rip cigars in that shed. Yeah. And then the following week, I'd go in to do pregame, and all the equipment still smells like cigars. It was a week later, and then windows open. didn't matter. Just, just cigars. During the commercial everywhere. breaks, they go out, even when it's here, they go out and smoke cigars and Love come it. back in with like 10 seconds. I almost the have, I it's probably have a half one every day, if not maybe. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, I love cigars. They're really, and like back in the day when I was on the old Patriots Radio Network, before they built that whole CBS scene and whatnot down yeah, there, yeah, whatever yeah. it's called now, yeah. we were in the tent outside one of the entrances, and uh, my sometimes spastic quarterback friend wasn't crazy about the cigar smoke. Got it. But old Tangway would sit there. Like back in the day when my grandfather had a pipe and then we'd be sitting, I'd fill that thing up with smoke sitting there. They got one sitting there going like this, waving the smoke away. Tangway's taking it in. Um, I'm honestly surprised the, uh, the red uh, jacket that I wear a lot of times. If I go in my garage or out back and have a cigar, Normally, that's, I'm surprised that I haven't walked in here and wafted oh, that yeah, you would have noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah it it's is. A matter of time. But it won't be overbearing, though. Okay. But I do. Hey, man, sip and smoke, dude. I'm down. I have no and, problem. And, with and we can have really uh, we can open conjecture on the smoke part of it. Sure. But Cam Newton is going to launch a digital talk show for BET called Sip and Smoke. It debuts tonight. Hmm. Uh, on the digital, was it today? It's today, it's right? Out, it, it's, it's already, already like out. Okay, ago. first one. So that's out. right. Digital when they drop it, you don't have to wait till seven o'clock Correct. whenever it airs or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So it's out. Um, so Ooh, they're kinda... competing against uh, Godzilla versus Kong. You would think some of the audience might gravitate towards yeah, this big movie on <laughs> big HBO. ratings battle there, huh? Yeah, I think so. There would be. It looks like uh, one of his guests is going to be Steve Harvey. Oh, um, I do like Steve Harvey. Which is, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm down. It's funny. Hey, I got the uh, list of people that uh, he's going to talk to. So it's going to be, uh, let's see here, Steve Harvey, 2 Chains. Okay. Oh, 2 Chains is sneaky old. The one thing about 2 Chains is... Really? I, two I didn't chain, know that. Take a guess. How old do you think 2 Chains is? He was drafted in the first <laughs> round in 99. <laughs> you think 2 Chains is 41? No, I'm going right. to say I'm gonna say 2 Chains is like my age. He's 46. He's 43. Okay, in between. 43. We split the difference there. Tiana Taylor, singer-songwriter, producer-activist David Banner, uh, prominent nightclub owner Mr. Magic. Wow. Now that is, be an that will be something. Mr. Magic. Yeah, All right. Uh, social good. media influencer Zoe, Z-O-I-E. I might be saying it wrong if I am. Don't yell at me. Uh, rapper and actress DeBrat. Uh, beauty industry maven Julie Dupart and former NFL wide receiver, now actor Devale Ellis. Um, what? DeVale I don't know Ellis. Uh, I don't know who that is. He played but in the NFL. Apparently, they they all get into and sample Cam's private selection of cigars and cocktails. I don't think. And oh, listen, I love it. That sounds like a great look, show. I, I know that we've gone round and round and round on the quarterback spot, right? And the whole what I think Belichick might be thinking of bringing Cam back or whatever. Now that's something I would do with that dude is to like uh, yeah yes. have some Cavassier and yes. a, and a nice stick. I am down. I think Cam Newton is no longer a good quarterback, but. He's got a great personality, and if he wants to host one of these shows, great, because we've seen him on other people's shows. We've taken audio yep. from other podcasts and other shows that he has been a part of, and he's great. And so this might be the future of Cam Newton. It's There's not no playing question. quarterback in the NFL. Cam Newton is an incredible human, and any disdain we express toward him is strictly in reference to his abilities on the football field. We love Cam deeply and wish him well, but we don't want him anywhere near Gillette Stadium. It's funny because everybody said when Gronk retired, like, oh, he could be a movie star. You're like, uh, I don't know about that. Whereas Cam Newton, if you're like, not not movie star, but if he's going to be like a, a oh, no, talk he, show host or something like that, okay, I could see that. Cam has movie star appeal. Yeah. Uh, the does. way he's look, he's built well. Very like, you charismatic. Know, yeah, yeah. Char- I mean, just oozes, right? Yeah. There's a lot of like rock qualities in Cam Newton. Yeah. I mean, the, the ability to speak. Alone. Well, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. But and I, the so, fact they're both swole. I mean, yeah. they're huge. Well, maybe Cam won't be as huge, but the rock no. is like. 
Maybe his skin's about to he's, burst. I think he's God gotten. Almighty. I think he's gotten too big. If that's such a thing, I would agree. I he's too jacked at this point. Yeah. But the thing with Cam too, and it's funny because I think some people might go towards. Oh my God! Can you believe Bill is uh, is allowing this? Well, take a look at the last several years. I think Bill's way more open to guys having a life than and, and being in in the public eye yeah. than you might think because it, times have changed. Bill is willing to adapt with the changes. And again, as long as Cam isn't going on sip and smoke and saying, you know who sucks is the Jets, and we're going to go out there and kick their ass. Right. As long as he's not giving bulletin board material for other teams, interview these celebrities. Have fun. Do whatever you want. I don't, as long as it doesn't affect the team or uh, affect your performance on the field, I really don't think he cares. And it's out of season. I think that's the other thing, too, is well, that that's true. when guys that's who true. would like go into TV stations that you and I might have done stuff at over the years, mm-hmm. and it's like, hey, man, what are you going in there for? Early on, there'd be a lot of ball busting on it. Now I think the internet has also changed things, too, because now the athlete has the ability to, quote-unquote, go direct to consumer, oh right? God, Whereas yeah. back in the day, like when Vince Wilfork used to do his interview on NBC Sports Boston, now he could just prop up a camera and do something on his own if he right. wants to. So I do think your your point is very well taken in that Bill has almost had to relent from that end. And look, that's the luxury of having a quarterback that's sort of played by the rules here as well. Brady had the power to go do the Tommy and Gronky show if he wanted to. Or Tom versus they, time. I'm, right. sure, I'm sure Bill didn't love it, hence why there wasn't a lot of uh, film inside the stadium. But what I mean, what are you really gonna do? Like, exactly. That, it wasn't it wasn't and even that was much more of Tom sort of at home. What's going on? Tom at home, but Tom talking about his future, and so that might have kind of bothered him more than say this show with Cam Newton or uh, Devin McCourty and his podcast or Julian Edelman and his YouTube videos and you know things like that. I think he's he's a little bit more open to that. But when you can stack all five of the Super Bowl rings you won with the guy on your middle finger and can flip them yeah. and be like, hey, I got as many as you, bro. Like, right. yeah. Right. And Giselle was a big part of that too, right? Because part. once well, the voice, all the, like voice, all yeah. well, and all of a sudden one day he showed up with a TV twelve hat and you're like, what the hell is that? Yeah. I mean, you know she's been in his ear on that stuff. Mm-hmm. Hey, the 17th game of the NFL season, that part of the schedule came out yesterday because as we touched on, it became official later in the afternoon that the NFL, they're going to 17 games. Players aren't thrilled. Hey, they're trying to figure it out. But it has definitely created some interesting matchups. In fact, the Dallas Cowboys and their terrible owner. From a football standpoint, from a businessman, he's a genius. Yeah, he knows but from the football that, yeah. standpoint, I don't right. know what he's doing. But it'll be uh, the Cowboys coming to Gillette Stadium for, I don't know if it's the exact week 17 matchup, but for the 17th week of the season, basically it's just the crossover formula between conferences. That's how you get the extra game. My guess is it won't be the 17th game because I think they love the idea of division matchups and the potential of a real play-in game. And you can sell it to NBC saying, hey, we'll flex in Cardinals, Seahawks, winner gets the division, or Patriots, Bills, winners out or losers out, you know that kind of thing. Yes. So my guess is the last couple of weeks are still divisional, but so now you sort of throw this in there, and again a potential advantage. If you think the Patriots have a chance at getting one of those wild card spots, you're going to be looking at the Browns, the Titans, uh, maybe the Broncos if they get a quarterback, like teams like that. You know, besides the Chiefs and Bills, are kind of obvious playoff teams. And say, all right, who's their 17th opponent? The Cowboys, eh, not bad. Could have been better, could have been worse, right? That's sort of a middle of the pack team, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. It's not like you have to play the Tampa Bay Bucks as your 17th game, or you have to play the Seahawks or the Rams or one of the best teams in the NFC. So that could be a, a potentially a pretty big swing game. And there were a couple that uh, jumped out. Tampa will be at Indianapolis. So right there, that's a great example where to me, the Colts are going to be another potential playoff team. And if you think it's pretty even, like their schedules, they end up playing kind of close. And that extra game is Cowboys versus Bucks. Uh, I'll take the Cowboys, thanks. Let let Indy lose to the Bucks. I know the Patriots are already playing with the Bucks, but my point is that bonus game that wouldn't have been on the schedule anyway for a team like Indy who's going to be fighting for a wild card spot. They have the toughest possible extra game they could get. You got Green Bay at Kansas City. That's probably the headliner of this yeah. whole seventeenth week in terms of the matchups. Minnesota at the Los Angeles Chargers. Now I know maybe it, maybe it maybe a swing game. Bingo. Maybe. Yes, it de- and depends on when it is in the year. But I mean, you can get excited for Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota's defense going up uh, against 
uh, the young quarterback out there with the Chargers. New Orleans at Tennessee. That's another one that uh, yeah. caught my eye. Yep. Now, if you're into, you know, what people you know, want to get into a little quarterback game here, Cardinals at the Browns. That could be an interesting little matchup. Mm-hmm. Rams at the Ravens. I think the NFL probably sat there and said, okay, based on the way everybody finished last year in the standings, how do we set this up for these best matchups for the first time out? I'm sure it was pretty easy for them to say this is the best overall grid, even though you right. do have Atlanta and Jacksonville. Okay, that's fine, but give me Kansas but City they're and also Green doing, Bay. They're doing division, right? Because this happens right. to be a year where the East is playing, the AFC East is playing the NFC South. But so for these one one offs, they're doing regional. So AFC East, they're going to play in the AFC East. Yeah, NFC East, West, West. It's, it's kind of like a tweak to the crossover yeah. that right. they already have. Right. Hey, look. Get ready. 18 games are coming in the next CBA. Hopefully we'll still be here around to talk about it. Uh, you got something to bring it home next. Back to Anything is Possible. Anything is Possible! Fresh and Keith on EEI. Tomorrow, Boston Red Sox baseball. Weather permitting. Oh, Have God. we done a little weather check? Are we... Yeah, uh, rain. Yeah, so basically, rain. we should plan on doing four hours tomorrow and I, hope for the I best would. kind of deal. I would. I'm okay. hearing it's supposed to be a lot of rain early in the morning and get drier as the day goes on. So there's still a chance. All right, Sean. Shime's weather sources. Oh no, no, but you my know my what? The shime over there. And you know what Shime? What Shime just did though was guarantee was guaranteed that it's going to be uh, downpour. Three ten first pitch. <laughs> so uh, pregame will come on at two ten. OMF completely wiped out, but the other the midday idiots can stay for mm. their extra hour kind of thing. All right, it's time for you got something, Keith. You got something? I do got something. How about this? The uh, they're continuing their guest hosts for Jeopardy, and starting on April fifth, Aaron Rodgers. Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers is going to host Jeopardy for two weeks. So if you've been uh, enjoying some of the uh, the fill-ins there, Aaron Rodgers is going to get an opportunity. And I didn't know this, but Shime told me that Rodgers was a part of like a celebrity Jeopardy yes. situation and dominated. That is correct. Because he was very, very good. Yeah. So. He's not a terrible host at it either, but it doesn't get the reaction Dr. Oz did. That yeah. was... That's no. quite a kerfuffle. Yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, Shime, you got something? I do, actually. Uh, the Off Day podcast featuring one Andy Hart and Ryan Hannibal actually welcomed me on. How do you like that? Uh, Hannibal claimed that I am the guy at the station who thinks he knows more about the NFL draft prospects than anybody else at the station. So it was probably. the wow. prop- I think I agree with that statement. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty fair. good statement by Hannibal. Uh, so uh, I, I joined them. We talked all the quarterbacks in the draft. Uh, the top five guys and all the guys that we think the Patriots might want to target. You mean the top five guys and Mac Jones? Yeah, sorry. The top five guys <laughs> and Mac Jones. That's correct. Uh, John, you got something? A huge weirdo move from Rich Keefe earlier this morning. Whoa! So, so I know. Well, I know let's shocker. Let, let's let the people decide. You're saying wow. weirdo. You're kind of swaying the audience potentially. So uh, the guest host this morning on the Greg Hill Show was one Brittany Baldessari. She uh, was on from 7 to 9. And so in the adjacent studio this morning at around 9 o'clock, myself, Andy Gresh, Rich Keefe are getting ready to record the dramatic reading of the Instagram DMs between Kevin Durant and Michael Rappaport. Mm -hmm. So 9 o'clock hits. uh, Brittany goes to leave the studio. And we're getting ready to record. You know, big moment thing planning for the show happening. Rich sprints out of the studio as she's walking out. And as the door is closing, Gresh and I hear him say, not to be weird, but. And then the door closes. (laughs) And we don't know what he said so with, rich with, his, with his mask on by the way yeah, with so, the mask on, so i'm being like, safe and running so, over with the n95 on and being like not to be weird lady but so, so rich can Brittany, you tell us what how, where this conversation went from here of course so Brittany was on the one of my favorite reality shows of all time actually my favorite reality show of all time mtv's the challenge she was on one season of that and they were talking about it on the show with her. So before she left, and I knew she was going to go left down the hallway and then gone. And who knows? If she doesn't get the job, I will never see her you ever again. You pre-planned her motions. So I walked out because I knew that she was done at 9. Yeah, so I walked yeah, out. Yeah. And I said, hey, not to be weird, I'm actually on the show after this. So I'm not just some like rando that, exactly like, that what he popped said. out of the building. Hey, uh, just to let you know, I'm a huge fan of the challenge. And then I asked her a couple of questions. Like if they invited her back. Who was, who was a loser on the show? Who was actually nice? Things like that. And she was very nice. Answered some questions, and then that was it. 
And the restraining order will be here later. No. Any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> Keep no, cornered her completely. He was great about it. I, want, however, I wanted to let her know. However, John and I start howling laughing because yeah. I said, I think he just went up to her and said, not to be weird. Not to be weird. I'm yeah. on the show that comes on after that this. Was, I don't know how familiar she is with the station. Uh, I'm probably like, not. Oh, hey, obviously, I'm uh, Rich Keith. Yeah. Like, that doesn't work. So I was just like, hey, not to be weird. I'm on the show after. Big fan of the challenge. She goes, oh, that's cool. Thanks. And then you told me something about how you... We desperately wanted to be on that show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I auditioned for The Real World in 2000. Six. Stop! <laughs> Write that down. We yeah, need to we'll explore this. To revisit this tomorrow. All right. Yeah. We'll pick that up tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. That's we fine. need to because I Love have it. lots of questions oh, have... on the whole. Great. Wait, Richard. you haven't applied for like a TV show before? Who, me? Yeah, you. Uh, no, I've been working. I have. <laughs> so well, I have a job. I was unemployed at the time. Yeah, I, we'll get into it I don't want to be a dink. It's just but, uh, like, I've been yeah. in this business forever and I haven't missed a day. So yeah. there was no. However, that does get into the discussion of the what game show or what reality show would you go on? Because I, that is that, something. I've applied one. to Jeopardy a couple times, actually. I've almost got on once. I almost got on the, for the college tournament. Fun fact. Hey, like that. Sean could have been on uh, Jeopardy. I, everybody thinks I'm stupid. I'm <laughs> actually a book nerd. I, I don't. <laughs> what, you don't. I can hear the guy now on Jeopardy, a slightly overweight NFL draft know-it-all from radio in Boston. Here's Chris Scheim. <laughs> He's standing there waving and all that stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, not qualifying for final Jeopardy is Chris. <laughs> Chris, thank you. You're negative $2,000. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're negative 2000 What do you have? Well, now you're back to even. In no, the left I'm, corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They don't shame you walking off the stage for God's it's a sake. New, it's a new Jeopardy. Now it's, they do. They it's do a that new now. Jeopardy. And then they throw you into a pit of piranhas. So they try to spice it up a little bit more now. The, the meaner Jeopardy now. They got to spice it up yes, a little bit, right? They do for There's ratings. just a trap door. All of a sudden you see a shirt What happened? You're contestant. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, Crash, you got anything? I do. And um, I am praying to God that UFC fighter Ben Askren Beats the bag out of Logan Paul. I'm so sick of these stupid Paul brothers. If there is a God in heaven, they would go on Jeopardy, both lose, and both get dropped straight down into a bunch of piranhas. And oh, by the way, there would be razor blades to cut them as they go in there so the piranhas would attack when they get in. Like, these Paul brothers are just a batch of jack wagons, and I really hope one of them literally gets beaten to the point to where they just lay there and they can't get up, and the rest of the world can laugh at them. Not big Paul and, fans. And for you... I'm with you, Gresh. And for you Zers out there, don't be like, I make $14 million a year on Instagram. Sometimes idiots make money. He also made a ton of money selling Pokemon cards. So Jeez. I like that. He made, like, over $4 million from a $300,000 box of Pokemon yeah, cards. Yeah, so what's next? His NFT? That yes, is that's be out exactly there? what that. that oh, that's how God. he made so much money. One of them was looting in Arizona over the summer as well. And didn't one of them put the video from Japan yeah. from Dead Forest and Horrible. stuff? Suicide like Forest, that? Yeah. Suicide Forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That yeah. is that's some weird stuff. All right, tomorrow, hopefully, we will hand it off to Joe Castiglione and Red Sox baseball. I need to find out about this audition for the real world from Keith. That I'm, I'm not. This might be the, the first. Problem. This might be the first driving home conversation between you and I. <laughs> like I need to know about it so bad. Oh my god, I gotta hurry up. We'll be back tomorrow. Christian Fourier staring at me at the door, and he's gonna get all sensitive. So we're out of here. OMF is next. Prom sex. This thing is over fast.